It's certainly good to be with you this morning, and it's great to have our visitors with us today. And I'd like to say to our visitors, if there's anything that you see or anything that you hear that you may have a question about, please ask. Uh, we would be glad to give you an answer for all that we say and all that we do. You know, the work of the church is the saving of souls. That is the Father's business, and it certainly should be our mission. But the problem is that sometimes we get very easily distracted, and we let the affairs of this life and the cares of this world uh, cause us to lose sight of our purpose. Too often the Lord's work gets crowded out of our lives because of the mundane and the inconsequential things of this life. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. And to illustrate how we can become too busy and not give proper attention to the matters of life and death, <clears throat> I want to recall the story from the life of King Ahab, who was the king of Israel. Now this story is given to us in the book of 1 Kings, the 20th chapter, and it concerns King Ahab and Ben-Hadad, who was king of Syria. Now during the days of the divided kingdom, Ben-Hadad had besieged the city of Samaria, and he made certain demands upon Ahab, verses 1 through 6. Well, not being content with Ahab's initial consent to do these things, Ben-Hadad then demanded yet more. And when Ahab refused to do this, Ben-Hadad set his army in array against Samaria. Well, God gave the victory to Israel. But Ahab was warned that the Syrians would be back in about a year's time, verses 7 through 22. And they did. And God gave the victory to Israel the second time. And so Ben-Hadad's servants, perceiving that the king of Israel was a merciful man, brought Ben-Hadad to Ahab. And Ahab accepted certain promises from Ben-Hadad, and then he set him free, verses 23 through 34. And it was then that a prophet of God, who was disguised as a wounded soldier from battle, he came looking for pardon from the king because he had been given this responsibility of keeping this prisoner in custody. And he said that the penalty of death would be upon him if he allowed that prisoner to escape. And he said to Ahab in verse 40, As thy servant was busy here and there, he says he was gone. The prisoner had escaped. And the king immediately gave consent of death upon this soldier because of his disobedience. And it was then that this soldier made known his true identity, and he made application to this charade, and he pronounced a judgment upon King Ahab and told him in verse 42, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. The application of this story here is as when we are in living life, we are in a life and death struggle to rescue perishing souls from the clutches of Satan. And God will grant us success if we do our part. Therefore, we have to assume the responsibility that is ours. But if we become busy here and there and we lose sight of our mission and we become derelict in our duty, by our own failure, we stand condemned. One of the most prevalent sins in the church today is what I call the sin of omission, not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Not many of us commit the overt acts of wrongdoing, like murder, robbery, drunkenness, adultery, most members of the church refrain from such things. But I suppose that every one of us is guilty of leaving something undone that we are supposed to be doing. Some do absolutely nothing to try to save the lost. You know, we have failed, I think, to impress upon the members of the church that being faithful is not just church attendance. We fail to impress that service to Christ 
far exceeds just attending services. James chapter 4, verse 17 says it very clearly. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, I don't care what it is, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And you know, the pathetic thing is that the majority of our church members are not doing what they ought. We're busy here and there doing everything in the world except being about our Father's business. Remember, Jesus came up to a fig tree one time and he cursed the fig tree because it had not fruit in Matthew or Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. He came upon this tree, it looked healthy, had all kinds of leaves, signifying it should have had some fruit, but there were no figs on it. It's kind of like the church at Sardis. It looked good outwardly, but inwardly it was dead and barren. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And brethren, fruit bearing is what really counts when it comes to the kingdom of Christ. Jesus said in John 15, verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so shall ye be my disciples. So how do we bear fruit? Well, first of all, by evidencing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, but also by bringing the lost to salvation in Christ Jesus by teaching them the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we don't walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and we don't try our best to win souls for Christ, then we are failing to bear fruit and we become empty and Jesus will not look favorably upon us. But when we do bear much fruit, then God is glorified, and then we can lay claim to being true disciples of Jesus Christ. Christianity, brethren, is an active religion, not a passive one. In fact, the very essence of serving Christ is to go and do, Luke chapter 10, verse 37. And there is just absolutely no way that we can sit around with folded arms and just look around us and do nothing when there are countless millions heading down that broad road to destruction. If we truly follow Christ's example, then we will get busy teaching and converting. The three parables of Matthew chapter 25, I think, all have a very vital message for Christians. And the major emphasis of these parables are, first of all, preparedness. We have to prepare ourselves studying God's Word, knowing God's Word so that we can teach it, and then using diligent effort in the use of our resources and the talents that we have been given, and then doing good while we have opportunity to do it. For all who profess to be Christians, we had better wake up from our lethargy and come to life, or we will not find our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus spoke to professed Christians in the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3, verses 15 through 16, and he told them, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Too many people, too many Christians, have allowed the cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches, the pleasures of sin to crowd the word of God out of their lives. They become too satisfied with doing little to nothing in the kingdom of Christ. And how sad will be the pronouncement at the great judgment when they have to hear, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. When we neglect to teach others, we neglect the great salvation. We neglect the Great Commission, and we deny our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, how shall we escape the wrath of God that cometh upon the children of disobedience? You know, Jesus Christ, he was busy about his Father's business, and he is our perfect example in fact, Peter said that he left us an example that we should follow in his steps, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. 
Even a casual study of the life of Christ reveals to us that he was very intent on doing the will of the Almighty God. <clears throat> Let's know some scriptures that actually show this. Now in John chapter 4, on one occasion, his disciples came to him and offered him food to eat. And he declined to take the food and he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And then just a couple of verses later, he says, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to accomplish his work. The thing that kept Jesus going, that kept him motivated, was doing God's will. In John 6, verse 38, Jesus said it this way, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And then as Larry read in John chapter 9, verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. There can be no doubt that Jesus Christ had a singular purpose and aim, and that was to do the Father's will. So what is the Father's will? Well, simply put, it is a salvation of souls. In John chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus himself said, and also in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. Listen to the words that Paul told the preacher Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 15. This is a faith, faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So surely as Christians and those who are people of the book, we should know that we are to be busy saving souls, being busy about the Father's business. We've done a lot of quoting of the Great Commission. I imagine most everybody can quote one of the versions of it. But the sad thing is we haven't done a whole lot of doing it. I really liked what Johnny Moore said in class this morning when he said, when all is said and done, well, usually more is said than done. And that's pretty much true. Even when it comes to the Great Commission, we say a lot, but we don't do that much. We have to do more than just to know it and to be able to quote it. We have to get out and we have to perform it or it does no good. Soul saving is what the Great Commission is all about, and this is doing the Father's business. <clears throat> but you know that less than one hundredth of one percent of the world's population has actually embraced the truth of the gospel? That's a very small number. So is it because the Father's business has changed? No, not really. As long as the world continues to stand, then God's business will be redeeming mankind back to him. In fact, this is what Paul told the Colossians in Colossians 1, verses 19 and 20. For it pleased the Father that in him, in Christ, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. God's design and his purpose are the same, they've always been the same, and it will never change. So is it because the opportunities are fewer? Again, six billion times no. We have more opportunities than we've ever had before. All we have to do is lift up our eyes and look out on the fields. Our opportunities are all around us. They may be next door, maybe across the street, Maybe somebody in our workplace that we're familiar with. It could be our neighbors. It could be our loved ones. It could be our friends. It can be any acquaintance. In fact, it may be even under your own roof. We can't say that we can't find someone who's interested in hearing the gospel, then I don't think we're looking real hard. And when I'm talking about evangelism, I'm not talking about just going out and door knocking. There's other ways that we can reach people, but we have to be using the opportunities that we have, and we need to be looking for those opportunities. <clears throat> so is it because we're lacking the means to be able to carry the gospel to others? Again, the answer is no. 
The church has more talent than ever. We Americans are more educated than we have ever been before. <clears throat> we may not have inspired men, but we do have the inspired word that all men can read and understand. We have more avenues today to spread the gospel, different ways to teach people. Look at the media, how it has changed. We've got the people with the brains, with the personalities, with the resources, and with the opportunities. So therefore, we have no excuse. So why is it that we are not about our Father's business? Well, first of all, I don't really think that many members of the church today truly believe that those who have never obeyed the gospel and are not members of the Lord's church are really lost. <clears throat> I'm afraid that we're not really convinced that a person who has never been baptized for the remission of their sins is really not saved after all. They don't really believe that people who are religious in any way can actually be lost. And it's really a sad state of affairs in the church today. Remember what Jesus said there in Matthew 15 verse 9? But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And to do something in vain means to do something for naught. When we worship God according to our own precepts, the way we want to, then it is for no good. It will accomplish nothing. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verse 24. That means that we have to have the right attitude in our worship. That means we have to worship according to what he said, the way he tells us to do it, according to truth, which is his word. Jesus said in John 8, verse 31 and 32, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And this is why all religious bodies cannot all be true because we don't all speak the same thing and therefore that means that we're not all preaching the same thing. Truth does not contradict itself. If we're all teaching the truth, we'll all be teaching the same thing, but that is not true in the religious world today. Only those who bear the marks of the New Testament church, the one that we read of in the Bible, they're the true church. And as long as we had this mindset that there are sincere, knowledgeable Christians in all denominations, then we will never be motivated to go out and evangelize this world. But the second reason why we probably don't do the Father's business like we should is because I believe a lot of the members of the Lord's Church have lost their real purpose and mission. No longer are we actually consumed about the fact that we are to be about our Father's business. No longer do we personally take that great commission because we have others to do that. I mean, I've heard it all the time. Let the preacher do that. That's what we pay him for. Or let the elders do it. They're the overseers. They're the ones in charge of the congregation. Or let somebody else do it. Maybe let that little group that goes around every Saturday knocking doors, let them do it. Every individual Christian has to somehow get this message planted in their hearts and their minds that I have a singular purpose and mission while I still am alive on this earth in my short time upon this earth that I must be about my father's business. That means being a soul winner for Jesus Christ. And when that finally becomes uppermost in the hearts and the minds of Christians everywhere, then we will see something wonderful in the kingdom happen, but not until that happens. And then another reason why we're not busy about the Father's business is because we're busy here and there with everything under the sun except for the Father's business. You know, it amazes me how much time and energy and effort and money that we'll spend on entertainment, on sports, on this club and that club and everything that passes with a with time, but how little time, energy, effort, and money that we will spend for the one thing that really matters, 
and that's doing the Father's business. And then to think that we're still okay in God's eyes. Any professed Christian who is too busy in the trivial matters to do the work of the Lord is going to be greatly disappointed come judgment day because the Lord will spew them out of his mouth. It's high time that we got our priorities straight, that we put the Father's business first, then everything else can come second. We should never let anything crowd out of our lives the one thing that really matters, and that is saving people's souls. And then the fourth reason why I don't think we're doing the Father's business like we should is because brethren tend to rationalize. We tend to invent every excuse under, the, under heaven for not doing the Lord's will. Now, I haven't been preaching very long. Now, some of y'all might think 18 years is a long time until you've lived 18 years, and 18 years is not that long. I haven't been preaching as long as HD. I haven't been preaching as long as Jerry and others. But you know, I think that I have probably heard a thousand excuses why I can't participate, why I can't attend, why I can't be involved, why I can't teach, why I can't work. I can't, I can't, I can't. You hear it all the time. Well, because company is coming over, or because I have a headache, because of the weather, because of Little League, basketball, track, band, the Cowboys are playing because, because, because. Excuse making has become a fine art among many of our members. It seems that we've become just like those that Jesus described in a parable that he taught in Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 18. He said, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. And you know what happens to excuse makers? Well, Jesus tells us at the conclusion of that in verse 24. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. The direction of our lives now and where we are going to spend eternity really depends upon the priorities that we have right now. I want you to look in a mirror and I want you to ask yourself a very important question. What is first in your life? And I want you to be honest with yourself. You don't have to tell anybody else, just answer yourself. What is first in my life? What is the most important thing? And then I want you to look into the scriptures. I want you to know what Jesus said in Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. This is the first and great commandment. Notice also what he said in Matthew 6:33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now that you've decided what's first in your life, and you've seen what God says ought to be first in our life, according to the scriptures, are they the same? And if they're not, maybe you need to make some amends today. Maybe there's something in your life that you need to change for the better, so you can be about the Father's business. So that you don't miss out on that great supper. And don't let somebody else miss out on that supper because you've been derelict in your duty to tell them the truth. Because you maybe you've misplaced your priorities. Now, you also have an individual responsibility to save yourself. You know, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and told them, save yourselves from this untoward generation. 
And you know what he told them to do to be saved is the exact same thing that we have to do today. It has not changed from that time, and it will never change to the end of the world. It's the same gospel. What they did on the day of Pentecost, same thing that we have to do today. Peter and the other apostles, they stood up and they preached Christ to the people. They instilled faith in them as to who Jesus really was. And they finally realized that they crucified the Son of God. And they cried out to the, the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You know what Peter told them? Nothing. You're okay. God will save you. His grace will cover you. If you know the Bible, you know that's not true. Peter told them in no unequivocal, unequivocal terms, repent, that means to change your mind about why, how you're living. If you're not doing things you're supposed to be doing, start doing them. If you're doing things you should not be doing, stop doing them. That's what repentance is. And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then he said, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which I believe in that context is salvation. If we do what they did, we too can have salvation. But you have to do what they did, and that's according to the gospel. If there's something that you haven't done, there's maybe you have some more study you need to do, please get with someone. Let us open up the scriptures with you. If you are a Christian and yet you've been derelict in your duty about being about the Father's business, let's make a change in our life. If you need the prayers of the congregation for strength, courage, Whatever you need, let us help you. Once you come, while together we stand and sing.